<laughs> Press A to play. Yeah, there's a song on Meteora called Faint, and it's still like one of my favorite songs. Oh, man. And right at the end, Chester goes into this scream. It sounds so sick. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was so sad when he passed. Oh man, yeah. I cried a lot when Chris Cornell passed. That was the one that hit me the hardest out of all of the um like the the losses of uh like the artists that I had known. That one hit me the hardest. And they were friends of course. Yeah. You know, ugh. Yeah, that's that really disturbing like three deaths basically being linked because the oh what's his name again? The in excess singer uh, of uh, course killed himself um, by hanging himself from like a door handle like 30 years to the day before Chris Cornell committed suicide in the exact same way really yeah oh. exactly 30 years after that in the exact same way and then of course uh, Chester like two months later on Chris's birthday also committed suicide and it's like those are three huge leading sort of men like three huge singers all being sort of linked through their suicide which is really dark but it's also sort of I don't want to fetishize it and I don't want to be like it's also sort of beautiful because I, I, I think that's very I, that can be considered I, I can understand that can be considered like sort of disrespectful or something but it's there's something weirdly comforting in a weird way of, of, of like these sort of tortured um, people sort of not being completely alone in that sense where mm. I don't know it's it's hard to explain but yeah yeah I, I don't feel like well I guess I, I have the luxury of being agnostic so I don't feel like being dead is necessarily a bad thing but it is unfortunate that um, those that are left behind uh, end up suffering for it yeah you know but yeah some people they just we don't know how to treat you know we don't know what it is that we ought to do for them and, and they end up suffering for a big part of their lives and so there is a certain kind of relief in knowing that they're not suffering anymore yeah I think the Chris Cornell one hit me because I had no idea but this was even on his radar. I mean, he seemed to have escaped, like, all this darkness and despair that had char characterized a lot because of the music he, from the he 90s. he talked about that, like, way back when, right? Like, that was sort of a part of, like, his... Like, the earlier part of his career, where he would talk, I think, about stuff like that. But I feel like he, he came across as someone who was... Ma he was sort of, like, dealing pretty well, who was sort of managing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the impression that I, that I got anyway. Um... But then, you know, you go back and you think about it for a moment and you realize, like, so many of his friends have passed. Yeah. You know, I like, I was thinking about the song uh, Like a Stone. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think the bassist, Comerford, um, was talking about uh, when he had had a conversation with Chris about, like, what that song was about type of thing and... Chris basically explains like all of his friends that have passed and I, and I find oh, you know like I kind of put it together all these people that I've seen him in pictures with all these people that were in the music scenes the different music scenes with him uh, as he was coming up and, like all his musician friends like so many of them had passed oh Jesus and taken their own lives or like I don't know we, uh, we lost them to drug addiction or, or something like this that uh yeah, suddenly, like, a, a picture sort of fell into place and um, just made it seem all that much more tragic. Yeesh. Wait, that's actually, that, that, that's actually a follow-up question, though, because, like, as someone who is now comfortable in saying that, yeah, I like a lot of the Linkin Park stuff, yeah. uh, and also someone who, when he was, like, when I was, like, eight, I think, or maybe even seven, like, I remember seeing Black Hole Sun, for example, on TV, like, the music video, and just loving that track. Yeah. And I remember listening to a cassette tape from Soundgarden. Like, are there specific albums that you would recommend to start with? Because I've been, because of this sort of Linkin Park roller coaster for the last couple of days, I was also like, yeah, I really like the few things I heard from Soundgarden back in the day. Mm. Uh, I really ought to sort of, you know, get into those albums. Is there a certain, like, starting point you would 
to so recommend or is it Soundgarden specifically or Chris Cornell because he's had a lot of uh, sort of eras in let's his say work. both yeah both yeah so um, the Soundgarden record that really catapulted them to superstar status was called Super Unknown so it's the oh, one yeah. that Black Hole Sun is on I, I even remember that title yeah and it's yeah I guess the sound that Soundgarden had cultivated really well typified on that record so there's lots of weird folk tunings and a handful of bizarre time signatures and lots of weird complex things going on musically that somehow Chris Cornell brings together in a very sort of accessible way super characteristic of like the Soundgarden sound so uh, all their biggest hits are probably on that record. Spoon Man, if you know it. Black Hole Sun is on there. Um, the Day I Tried to Live is on there. It's a very sort of grimy, murky, dirty sounding record. But Ooh, um, That sounds good, though. Yeah, it's... It's so hard to say what record somebody sh ought to get into, but uh, that one is certainly the most accessible and the most signature you know the, the, the moment where they like I think fully understood their signature sound as a band I think was probably that record uh, it's a perfect album top to bottom every single song is non-skippable it's weird oh that's um, good I but all their hits are on it again like they just have this weird ability of, of writing super weird shit but then making it really Chris just makes it accessible with his voice they really nailed it on that record Actually, all their sounds are on there, too, though. Mad Cameron has this very, also, like, like, this drum sound that kind of sounds as if you're in the room with him, and that sounds like it's not perfect on purpose, almost, or like, like they weren't trying to make it perfect or super polished. And, and this is very characteristic of his sound as a drummer. Does that really well. Um, that sounds really cool, actually. Yeah, and it's what I what I love about the sound on that record is that it like really does not sound over polished. So the the albums that I like the best sound as if you're like almost in the rehearsal room oh, with yeah. the band. Oh, do uh, do you know Guided by Voices? Oh, my, oh, um, this is familiar to me. Like the record uh, B thousand is just like it. It's you're just like you're just chilling with a couple of guys in the garage playing their music, and it feels it, it sounds so good because of that. Actually, like that. You can just you can just feel sort of every part of the song being um, it's like it's very physical. It's very like you can just reach out and touch the actual yeah. process of the music being made. It's there's a certain something like a lot of music is amazing because it's just produced really well. But for some this stuff, it's sore, just, dude. for some for some stuff, it's just it just feels so good to be able to sort of like like it feels like you're right there with the music being. Uh, being played that's what does it for me i like the records that sound like literally like you're, you're you're in the rehearsal room they don't sound overly polished they don't sound like artificial i mean actually that's not true i oh, can sure. appreciate I records that sound. Started. oh is it yeah we have to go across yeah. um i can appreciate records actually that do go all the way in, into like artificial sounds and everything they can be creative in i guess a bit of a different way but the rock records that have touched me the most, I promise you, they sound like you're like right next to the dude as they're recording it or something. And that Soundgarden record like, like exemplifies it beautifully. Um, and also, Chris really stretches on it. And I can imagine as he uh, aged, it must have gotten harder and harder to hit those notes. Uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, I did not realize for years that that guy who did the Casino Royale song oh, yeah. <laughs> was the guy I knew from Black Hole Sun from my childhood. Like, I... Because he... But, I mean, like, he as a... had eras, man. Like, as a compliment, though, because, like, he does... He, it's not like he sounds worse or better. It's just completely different. He does a completely different thing with his voice on that track, for example. Or, like, holy crap, how is one person capable of performing both that convincingly and something like Black Hole Sun? Like... <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, so... Like, that's range. The, um... 
The Soundgarden record is kind of like one dimension of his work. The first uh, Audio Slave record was also a very interesting moment in his but career. So I, Audio Slave is also him, right? Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting that, but like, okay, yeah, that's. It's him and the band members of Rage Against the Effing Machine. Oh, <gasps> how? Oh Christ! I, they see this is this is what happens when you when you when you're prejudiced with regards to certain parts of like music. Like I know way too many way too. I listen to way too many uh, obscure artists that nobody knows, and I'm like. Just, I know every little weird trivial thing about the things I love, but for some reason, like especially when it comes to like a lot of like more modern rock, actually, I I never got it. I'm like I wasn't even aware. It never. I, I probably have read it before, but it never really registered with me that that's fucking Rage Against the Machine and Chris Cornell. Yeah. That, Jesus Christ. Rick Rubin put them together, recorded that first record, and that's a ridiculous. Super band. Yeah, yeah. It was a very, very bizarre uh, moment in a lot of ways, but it came together and sort of uncomfortably worked. Like, I feel like that band found its sound, you know, um, well, in a way, almost immediately, but then it, it kind of changes on their second record. But that was that was a very, very interesting moment, and, and a lot of their iconic songs are on that album. So for that era of Chris Cornell, that's great. Um... He's had a lot of uh, different kinds of solo work. Like, he's got a, a record with Timbaland. I don't know if you know that. Oh, for real? Dude, he... <laughs> oh, damn. He got criticized for it by uh, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails. But I have to be frank, it is it is super catchy. It's definitely, like, a poppy-sounding record. But, man, it's, I don't give... It's good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I do prefer rock music, of course. I like, I like Chris Cornell's rock stuff. And, yeah. Like... But Him other stuff Soundgarden. can work from time to time, yeah, I mean... But he, like, he tried it, you know? Like, he tried it, he tried to do a record with Rick Rubin. He wrote sick, catchy hooks, beautifully layered vocals, and his vocal performance on it is really quite exceptional. Um, yeah, so that, that's always an interesting one to look at. It's really fun that there's so much for me to sort of... I mean, this uh, the same thing happened, like, a couple of years ago, when I was like, wait, I have always loved the Social Network soundtrack by... Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why have I never actually gotten into Nine Inch Nails? And I started listening to Nine Inch Nails, and I was like, shit, I love this. And I was like, wait, I also had all these weird sort of, um, like, I, I was always really prejudiced when it came to Rage Against the Machine. Like, oh, it's a specific kind of person. And I was like, but that was based on nothing. Why don't I listen to it? And I was like, oh, shit, I fucking love this. And, yeah. Jesus. That... that I mean, the, for me, the, the, the big moment that I finally realized, like, hey, you're doing yourself a disservice by being so judgy when it comes to a lot of music you haven't really checked out, is when in 2015, uh, I realized that I had been, like, a horrible, horrible asshole with regards to Genesis um, in the Phil Collins years. Okay. But I'd never actually, because I knew the hits from that era, and those I really do hate. <laughs> but I never actually, you know, got into all of it. So it's like, why don't I? And I then found out that the first three records after Peter Gabriel had left are by far my favorite Genesis records because that's when they had, like, the perfect balance between prog rock and some more pop sensibilities in there. So that's before, like, they had their monster hits. Uh -huh. But they are more accessible and they are more poppy than the Peter Gabriel stuff. And I like him better because of it. And I was like, shit, I've been always such a prick about people liking the Phil Collins Genesis, but my three favorite Genesis records are all with Phil Collins as the <laughs> singer. So it's like, shit. And then I found out, like, oh shit, I even like the first two records by Phil Collins, like his solo records. I was like, fuck, I've been talking shit for years. Yeah, I feel like every, uh, every band has a sweet spot, you know? Yeah. Um... But and if they're with, yeah. truly exceptional, they might have a second sweet spot in their career. Or their entire career is one big sweet spot, like Zappa is for me. Ah, uh, yeah, homie was, uh, he, he's an alien. It's, it's, he's gotta it's be, ridiculous. it's the only logical explanation. It's still the most ridiculous career ever, like, over 60 albums just in his life. And then this shit he, that, that's been released, like, uh, posthumously is 
My God. He's an alien. Yeah. That's, I, I, I really, I'll stand by this. Only logical yeah. explanation for Zappa. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, no, it's true. Like a lot of a lot of musicians I love have like those first albums or like maybe like uh, like sort of halfway through their career. But there, there's always this sort of era you can point to and be like, that's when they really knew what they were doing and they were really doing it amazingly well. I feel like the moments that are interesting to me are the moments when the band is just beginning to understand what its sound is. Um, but before they've like really fully understood it and like really know how to do that oh, thing, yeah. you know? And so uh, for me, it's that Soundgarden record. Um, although the album before it and the album after it and the album after that were all amazing to me. But that one Soundgarden record, Super Unknown, really typified it for me. For Nine Inch Nails, it's a downward spiral if you've listened oh, to that. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. It's, oh, Jesus Christ, that album. Whoa. It's, it's not even cool how fucking amazing that record is. It's just like beginning to end. Yeah, the, the, the craziest journey. Um, yeah. Yeah. What an era. I don't know. I feel like I, I must be biased, of course, because, uh, you know, I was a certain age in the early 90s, and, and so, of course, I'm going to think that the music f from that era was the best, but that gave us Tool, Nine Inch Nails, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden. Like, so many of these amazing, amazing uh, artists came out of that era. Nirvana, I can't believe I forgot oh, yeah. to mention them. Pearl Jam. All at a time when, like, I feel like the glitz of of hair metal or whatever it is had just freshly died and what was left over were all these surprisingly humble musicians that were i don't know playing this kind of very raw uh very heartfelt rock or like collections of flavors of this raw kind of heartfelt rock and i just i loved so much of it yeah it's it's i i never really like got into it as in started really exploring it like i i grew up with nirvana because my mom was really much into nirvana like uh like the late 80s uh, i think through my uncle she uh, got to know nirvana like before they really hit it big okay and so that was like a part of my childhood like because my mom liked it and my sister was into it um but i never so again i i knew i was aware of the fact that i liked like that corner of like rock that era of rock but i never sort of actually started exploring it um, because i was too busy with hip-hop electronics uh with um like weirder pop um and with rock i i liked a lot of the like i was always into the who like oh okay. like, like crazy i love uh led zeppelin like that era but i never i always i don't know because i same with Pearl Jam. I've always had like this, oh yeah, Pearl Jam, because then I knew like a handful of people who I thought weren't like amazing at, uh, you know, who, who, I, who I was convinced of didn't have the most amazing, most tasting music, even though that honestly isn't a thing. Like, there's no such thing. Uh -huh. Thankfully, I'm now old enough to understand that. But I knew them to be fans of Pearl Jam, so I then made up my mind that Pearl Jam wasn't that good without ever listening to a Pearl Jam record. I still haven't ever put on an actual record, but I, at least for some time, have now realized that I should check them out at one point because I don't know if I would like them or not. Yo, bang out 10. 10 in verses, so good. Well, again, I'm biased for that one particular era. But yeah, but that's if, 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 like, if I like uh, Nirvana and if I like uh, Rage Against the Machine and if I like Nine Inch Nails and if I uh, like the stuff I've heard from Soundgarden and if I like Linkin Park and if I like a lot of things I always thought I didn't like from that era and from beyond there's I'm guessing a pretty big chance I will at least sort of enjoy Pearl Jam for example I, this is so cool though man yeah. because like you you never listened to him before so you get to discover all that shit yeah. now <laughs> how amazing I mean I'd give anything to listen to like a tool record again for the first time you know but it's really fun for me because i i always keep looking for new music and i i i'm, I'm pretty mournful a lot of the times because i was like eight when i started listening to todd rundgren i was like 10 when i started listening to the doors and miles davis and marcus miller and moby yeah. 
um, like 11 when Gorillaz, um, all, like I was really young when I discovered all these amazing artists and I'm, I've always been like, shit, I, I've had all my amazing discovery moments. Um, but uh, like Prince when I was like 12, like all of that stuff, I, I started buying my own records and everything. And it's just nice. really fun to now be like, oh shit, there's all these amazing artists that I, for no reason whatsoever, uh, deemed to be bad. And I can now actually and, like discover them and enjoy them and be new to it. And it's actually a lot of fun. Yeah, dude. You're so lucky. <laughs> I am, yeah. I mean, this is the, I mean, this is the awesome thing about music somehow is like there's always more amazing artists yeah. somehow magically humanity manages it you know like you were talking about a lot of um the rap music that just continues to push boundaries uh, and i don't know how these artists do it but um, for me like that's it's it's in the end like that's by far the uh like that's the the stuff i listen to the most and that that's been most present even though it, it's not what I've been listening to for like the longest amount of time, it's like late high school, I would say. But yeah, I mean, like these days we have like Tyler the Creator, we have Kendrick Lamar, oh, we have Lupe Fiasco, Childish Gambino, uh, Kanye West, Common. Um, we have Vince Staples. We like there's so much amazing stuff out there. We have Baz. We oh, there you go. Um, just Kendrick alone. Dude, Kendrick, it's, yeah. <laughs> Whenever he releases something, I feel like I need months to digest it. And, and you know, at the end, of course, I still don't fully understand it, but, like, I've started to wrap my head around it, at least. To Pimp a Butterfly still, like, one of the greatest That's records. That's my favorite Kendrick record, like, by far. Like, holy fucking crap. That, no record should be that good. It is, but it, it shouldn't be. Out. Yeah, it's, like, not fair somehow. Yeah. Which is, like, that's... I, I, I hate it when albums are that good because it can really sour you on the follow-up, even though the follow-up is actually a good record in its own right. Like, I never really enjoyed Damn, even though it's, it's a really good record. Yeah. But after To Pimp a Butterfly, Damn, to me, felt so commercial and so barren and so flat I just did not enjoy Dam at all when it came out because all of the funk and jazz and soul and, and weirdness of To Be a Butterfly was just not there yeah I had that with the Gorillaz as well like that first record of Gorillaz oh, felt man. like that was like such a desolate record like that first Gorillaz album is it feels like you're just fucking alone in this wasteland and it's so powerful and how fucking lonely and dark it feels and it, it's like they feel like lost characters and they do feel like characters in that first album yeah and then you have demon days which is a ridiculously good album but when i heard it for the first time all i could think was i was like i think 13 or 14 and i got it for my stepdad i got like the ultimate deluxe edition and all i could think was was like this is so slick and so commercial and it doesn't sound like 2d it sounds like Damon Albarn loving everything he's doing. And there's choirs and there's just this way too slick sound. And I, I hated it because it wasn't anything like that first record. Thing is, it's yeah. an amazing album and I love Demon Days. But, but that's was, what I mean. Like, there's yeah. a sweet spot, you know? Yeah. And I feel like, so for the, the, for the gorillas, I feel like they were there right out the gate, you know, yeah. like they were just about to discover really what their sound was right at the Those beginning. Those first two records are just fucking perfect. Like yeah. Gorillaz and Demon Days are just... Same with N.E.R.D., by the way. Like the first two N.E.R.D. albums, I loved those so much. And then they just fucking rode off a cliff. Like I was obsessed with N.E.R.D. Like I was 12 when I went to Pink Pulp. Uh, like the festival oh yeah okay I, my dad bought tickets because he knew I was that big a fan he bought tickets for us to go to fucking Pink Pop because NERD was playing like I was that big a fan and then the third record happened and my god it's and that's not because I was I wasn't soured on it because it was different it was just bad like everything they put out afterwards <laughs> was just bad <laughs> like Pharrell cannot help it like I don't know he, he's he's 
he's way too uh it's way too easy for him for him to just phone it in he, he really can just phone it in which is sad because he's also one of the best producers out there and he's been actually doing a shit ton of amazing stuff in the last like three four years i remember reading there was a period of time where like Oh, Some forty yeah. percent of all yeah. Billboard charting yeah. hits were him or something. Yep. <laughs> Can you imagine? The, the Neptunes did everything. Like it was um, Paula Beck girl. It was Toxic. It was Work It. It was um, really like yeah. So like Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, Gwen Stefani, um, Snoop Dogg, Jay Z. All of their tracks. That was all the Neptunes. It was ridiculous. They were like all of the music. That was then. It was it was seriously one of the most insane production runs in history wow. ever. Like I don't think you can. I, I honestly think there's no way to sort of overstate the importance of the Neptunes in like the first five, six, seven years of this century. It's 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 really fucking creepy how omnipresent they were. Wow. Like shake your ass, like uh, Khalees, uh with milkshake. Like, oh yeah, yeah, all of that. That all of that shit is the Neptunes. Absolutely insane, Pharrell. What a beast! Uh, you know his iconic four beat intro, right? Um, f- to what? Every every song produced by Pharrell or the Neptunes, but so you know that obviously includes him. Every song starts the same way. It's seriously <laughs> hilarious because he wasn't aware of it when he was actually called down on it. And he was like, "Oh shit, you're right. I never noticed." <laughs> he, like every every single track will start with the sort of main beat of the track repeating itself four times, like sort of a metronome start to a, like a song. Uh, okay. So like when you have kick push from Lupe Fiasco, you have like. Mm, mm, mm and then he'll go into the song but that also goes for like um, Drop It Like It's Hot and that goes for Beautiful with Jay-Z and that goes for all of those songs It's there's like uh, compilations on YouTube where like every single song he's ever produced starts the same way and he was actually when he was asked about it he was like fuck I never realized that but you're right no it's not an aesthetic choice it's not like something uh, it's not like a, a conscious like calling card or like a sort of signature thing it was like I, yeah that just comes natural to me like before you start the track like proper you sort of you know start off with the main beat and then you get into the track it's just an easy way to sort of get into it before really getting into it but it's really funny. In that way, you will instantly recognize the Pharrell-produced track. They all just, they all start the same way. <laughs> <laughs> 